This lecture will be a study of the epithelial tissues of the human body. The epithelial tissues will be covered in both detail and in an overall perspective. You should remember that in our previous lecture, we covered all four tissue types and spent some time with general characteristic epithelial tissues. So we learned that epithelial tissues cover and protect the other tissues of the human body, and they also act as entrances and exits from the human body. Anything that enters the human body must cross through an epithelial tissue, and likewise, substances that are leaving the body must cross epithelial tissues. The surface glands of the human body, the glands that are associated with epithelial tissues, um, are ones like sweat glands and digestive glands. Um, so glands are also, exocrine surface glands are also epithelial tissues. Every epithelial tissue has a structure making it thin and flexible so it contours to the surface of the tissues underneath. And having two sides, it has a free surface, which is the surface of uh, the human body, whether it's internal or external. And it has a basement membrane basically attaching it to the tissues underneath that it's covering. We learned that epithelial tissues have a dense cellular structure, that they are tightly packed cells, and that they are avascular, meaning that there are no blood vessels within the substance and structure of epithelial tissues. So as we look at epithelial tissues and want to distinguish the various types from one another, we want to first focus on two distinct characteristics. And let's illustrate those and get you thinking about those by looking at these two pictures. These are pictures of two epithelial tissues. And you can see that they have a lot in common. There's a gray connective tissue layer that they are covering and protecting. You can see right above that, that pink line of the basement membrane. They both have a free surface. They both are constructed from cuboidal cells. But what is it that's different about the two? And of course, as you look at it, the answer is the number of layers. So the first distinct characteristic of epithelial tissues is that they come in a variety of layering patterns. We have a number of words that will help us to distinguish each of the layers. To the right in the pictures is a single layer of cells. And when we see a single layer of cells, we refer to that tissue as a simple epithelial tissue. So simple is the word that is used to describe a single layer of cells forming the epithelial tissue. If there are multiple layers, if there are more than one layer, then we use the word stratified to describe that type of epithelial tissue. So here's an example of a simple type and a stratified type. Strata is, of course, a word from the Latin that's used in many disciplines, uh, probably the most notably in geology, where people study layers of rock and call them rock strata. Here are a couple of examples of epithelial tissues. In the first picture, you see the outside world and the inside world. You see an outer space. You see a row of cells. And then you see a lot of various connective tissue or whatever underneath that. The little arrows in the picture, the little lines, are pointing out the cells and the basement membrane and the free surface of that little row of cells. This, of course, would be a simple epithelial tissue. The picture next to it, from top to bottom, you see at the top a free space and a free surface. 
You see way down near the bottom, the dark pink area, there's a row of cells at the bottom, and there will be a basement membrane there. And there are obviously many, many layers of cells here, many cells, one on top of the other. They get, begin with sort of cuboidal-shaped cells at the bottom, and you can see they gradually become flattened as they near the surface. So this, of course, is a stratified epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissues come in two distinct layering types. And luckily for us, there isn't a name for like a two-layer tissue or a three-layer tissue or a four-layer tissue. The convention is simply use the word simple for a single layer of cells and use the word stratified for two or more. In the handout that you have that relates to this lecture, we see a diagrammatic re representation of determining here's the simple and here are the stratified. And then you can see within those both, there are other characteristics that divide the simple and the stratified into various types of epithelial tissue. And so epithelial tissues have a layering type, and then there's a second characteristic. And let's look at three more pictures, and notice that these are very much alike. Connective tissue layer at the bottom, there's a basement membrane, a layer of glue, and then a layer of cells, and it's a single layer of cells in each case. There's a free surface at the top, but something very different about these three pictures. And of course, I think you can pick it out right away. It's the shape of the structural cells. The cells in the three pictures have different shapes. The first shape is, of course, a very flat cell, kind of like floor tiles or flagstone, something where you use a very flat kind of object to cover a floor surface. The second are cells that are sort of the same dimension all the way around. They are the same width and height. They form sort of an even sort of structure to themselves. And then the third picture to the right is, of course, very tall cells. And so each of these three shapes is different. Each has a name, so let's go through them one by one. The first that we looked at are called squamous cells. Squamous. The A in the word is pronounced like the letter A. And of course you want to do this if you're ever in a medical situation. You're talking to people that are medically knowledgeable. You don't want to say something like squamous or whatever. Squamous is the accepted pronunciation for this word. And here are squamous cells these flat cells. The picture directly under with the labeling shows you it in cross-section. The second picture to the right of that shows sort of a top view and a side view. And these are the only cells that do have a different appearance when you look at them in a cut cross-section versus a top view. The other cells that are like equidimensional are going to look the same whether you're looking at it from the top, side, back, or wherever. And the third view, the pink view, shows you what the cells would look like if you're looking directly down on the top of them. And you can see they make sort of a patchwork or a jigsaw puzzle of cells forming a covering, protecting layer over the rest. Now, this tissue has a name. And the name of the tissue derives itself from the number of layers, the shapes of the cells, and the simple term epithelial tissue. So in naming this, the first word you would use would be the layering word, which is, of course, simple. The second word is the shape of the cells, which is, of course, squamous. And the third word can be the word epithelium. Epithelium is a short, single word that means epithelial tissue. So one could say simple squamous epithelial tissue. 
but it's typically shorter and easier to just say simple squamous epithelium. So that's pretty much at your uh, prerogative as to what you would want to do with that. So simple squamous epithelium. Let's look now at the second type. Remember the second shaped cells were somewhat equidimensional. The term we use for these is cuboidal. The cells are basically equidimensional. We want to be careful here that we don't think that these um, have corners or that they're boxes necessarily. Unfortunately, in this picture, the artist drew all the cells that you see in the picture as little boxes with corners and all. And that is not typically the case in the human body. If you look at the picture, the photograph, through a microscope of some cuboidal cells, again, let's point it out, there's a cavity through the middle of the picture, which is actually the form of a tube. If you can imagine a tube or a pipe, if you were to cut it lengthwise <clears throat> and then look where it's cut, you would see two cut surfaces. And if that pipe were made out of cuboidal cells, the edge would show you the cu cuboidal cells as it does in this picture. You see a row of cells above the cavity and a row of cells below the cavity. And these are not cells that look like boxes. They look like balls or circles, don't they? Right. But a uniform ball like a uh, a basketball or a volleyball or a soccer ball is the same dimension in all cases. And that's the case here. We're looking for cells that are the same height and width. You would never confuse one of these cells with a squamous cell. And this tissue is as easy to name as the previous one was. It's a single layer of cells, so we use the word simple. It's equidimensional shaped cells, so we're going to use this word cuboidal, and it is an epithelial tissue or an epithelium. Obviously the same thing is going to be th true for the third shape. The third shape is going to be called columnar. Uh, think of the columns that hold up the roof on a building. They're typically narrow and tall, and that's the case here. These cells that make up a columnar epithelium have a height to them. They're much taller than they are wide. In a photograph, like you see at the side here, um, you can see the basic height of that layer of cells. It's quite a tall layer from the free surface above down to the basement membrane below. Each of the cells is very narrow. When you look through the middle of that area, you see these oval structures, which would be the nuclei of each cell. And if each cell has a single nucleus, then the nuclei side by side, like you see, indicate the width of the cells. So even though the cell membranes are not very obvious, the width of the cell and the height of the cell gives you the understanding that this is made up of tall cells. And again, the name here is as easy as it was before. It's a single layer of cells. These are columnar cells, and we use the word epithelium. And so when we have this uh, layered type that we call simple, and it's three types derived from that, you can see we have simple squamous, simple columnar, and simple cuboidal tissues that we can identify on the basis of the number of layers and the shapes of the cells. So that's a good start to this. If you look over at the stratified area, we haven't got there yet, but you can see that it's the same layout. We have a stratified, we're going to have layered tissues, but the cells are going to be squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. So you've got the basic layout with these two characteristics. So that's an important place to get to in your understanding of epithelial tissues. Now secondly, you can see we're going to detail some special types, and we'll get to those in a moment. But before we do, we need to talk about a couple of special characteristics related to columnar epithelium. 
And so let's look at two extras, two things that we typically find associated with the columnar type cells. And the first is what we're going to call goblet cells. Now I need you to imagine for a moment a wine goblet that has a wide mouth at the top and a narrow structure down below. Goblet cells are illustrated in the picture you see as the cells that are in blue. The columnar cells are purple, but you see a whole um, host of those blue cells up above, and many of them do have this sort of goblet shape. They are not exactly the columnar cells. They are their own goblet cells. And what's fascinating about these is these are the cells that produce mucus. So from that, you can probably gather that all of our mucous membranes are simple columnar epithelia. The blue cavities that you see there are full of mucus. And of course, each of these cells is a factory producing mucus. That's its entire job. Here's what one of those single cells would look like, attached down to the basement membrane. But you can see there vesicles of mucus, and they get stored up in there so they're ready to go. And when the, the tissue needs some mucus to be released, it will be released from that free surface end of the cell and will coat the outside surface of the simple columnar epithelium. So we often, often find goblet cells associated with simple columnar epithelium, and they are mucus producers. The other characteristic that we often see with simple columnar epithelium is something called cilia. And you see those, you can see some cilia in the picture. It looks like a little fringe running across the free surface of the columnar cells. These are actually little bristles, a little bristle-like structure that sticks up off the surface, and it's used to move fluids that are in contact with the surface of the cells. In this case, these bristles could actually move the mucus along the surface of the tissue, and they do. Here's a cell with some cilia sticking up. They have little motors down below, or little contractile fibers, that can actually move the bristles in sort of a rowing action. And just like oars on a boat might push water by, the cilia on the surface of a columnar epithelium will cause fluid to move. A good example of this would be um, in a woman's reproductive system. She has ovaries that produce eggs, but the eggs, if they're going to be fertilized and going to grow into a child, need to make their way to the uterus. And there are tubes that lead the eggs to the uterus. They're called fallopian tubes or uterine tubes. The egg has no ability to move. Um, the sperm from the male have little tails that will whip, and they can actually swim to join or meet an egg, but the eggs have no ability to move. And so how do they get from the ovary to the uterus? Well, the fallopian tubes are lined with a simple columnar epithelium that is ciliated. The cilia sort of row or beat fluid down toward the uterus, and the egg actually just rides the current of fluid all the way down the fallopian tube to the uterus. So here's a case where the cilia are actually helping to move cells to the place that they need to arrive. Here's a picture of a simple columnar epithelium that's ciliated, and you can see the little bristles sticking up from the surface. So in this case, we would describe this tissue, and we would include the word ciliated in the definition of simple columnar epithelium. So there are two characteristics that are only associated with the simple columnar epithelium. 
Now, in the simple epithelial tissues, there is one special type. And this is a type that has a varying characteristic. And that varying characteristic is the number of layers. You know that all of our epithelial tissues are typically simple or stratified. But here we have a special type of simple columnar epithelium that is known as pseudostratified. Now that name will mean something to you if you know the word pseudo or the piece of the word pseudo here. You know stratified means layered. But what does pseudo mean? And many people will guess, oh, it means false. And yes, it does. But it's something a little more than false. Oftentimes, things that are false are blatantly false. Like if I said right now that I'm speaking to you in Russian, you know that that is false, obvious. The term pseudo really means fake or phony. Something that is fake is not the real thing, but it looks like it is. It appears to be the real thing. Um, there are places you can go, usually in the downtowns of big cities, um, where people are selling things on the street corner, and they're often selling what look to be very expensive watches or purses or some sign up type of fashion item that would normally cost you thousands of dollars, but they're going to make you a deal and sell it to you for 50 or 100. Well, you know that you're not buying the real thing. You're buying a fake. And so the word here is fake stratified. In other words, if I said that's a fake Rolex watch, you'd know it wasn't the real thing. It would look like a Rolex watch. So pseudo stratified means fake stratified. It looks like stratified, but it isn't. So a pseudo-stratified special type is actually a simple type of epithelium. It just appears to be layered. And here's why. The cells have a very interesting arrangement. These are all columnar, tall cells. It's tall enough that the total bulk of it could appear to be several layers of cells. And in the picture here, you see cells that are tall and columnar. Some of them look like they're shorter. In reality, those cells are actually wrapped around other cells and reaching the top behind them. So it's a very disorganized, a very haphazard arrangement of cells. And because of that, some of the nuclei are found near the bottom of the cells and some of the nuclei are found near the top. If a nucleus was to indicate the presence of a cell, to have a layer of nuclei above and a layer of nuclei below would indicate to somebody looking at this tissue that it was several layers of cells. If you look at the picture to the right of the tissue under the microscope, you can see that. You can see that there definitely appears to be those dark nuclei, one on top of the other toward the surface. And so this tissue isn't too difficult to identify. When you're looking at simple columnar epithelia, all of the nuclei will tend to fall in a very narrow range of height right through the middle of the cell. In this case, the nuclei are all over the place. And that will help you recognize um, a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And so here are our four basic simple types of epithelial tissue. Simple squamous, simple columnar, simple cuboidal, and the pseudostratified columnar. Those are the four types. Now over the other, on the other side of the picture, you can see there's going to be four types. There's going to be the three that fall in the same pattern as the simple did, and a special type called transitional. So here in the stratified epithelial types, let's first deal with the stratified squamous epithelium. And here's what that looks like. To the right of the picture, you see many, many, many layers of cells from the basement membrane right up to the free surface. 
No one cell is both at a basement membrane at a free surface like they would be if they were simple. This is many, many, many cells. The question now for you is to think, where do all these layers come from? There must be some cells that produce all of these cells. We know that every living cell comes from another cell by the process of mitosis. Mitosis is just a growing and a dividing of a larger cell into two smaller cells. Every cell is derived from a previous existing cell. So where are the cells that reproduced all of these? And of course, the cells that do that would be the ones at the very bottom, the ones attached to the basement membrane, the ones that aren't going anywhere. These are the cells that multiply constantly. And that's really their only task in life. These cells at down next to the basement membrane just reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. And in that, those cells have to go somewhere, so they go up above that, that row of cells, and that shoves the cells above them up farther, and up and up and up. And so, little by little, all of the cells make their way toward the surface. Um, in the photograph next to it, you can see those would be the cells right down here. They don't look big and mature like the, the cells above. You can see that the cells near the surface have had uh, time to mature, time to grow, time to develop into something. Cells that are constantly mul multiplying never look anything more than young, young cells. In the picture here, you can see that the cells that are the oldest, the ones that are near the surface, are the mature cells. And the cells at the surface are a flat type cell, a squamous cell. And so here's the deal. Even when, when I look at stratified tissues, there's often two different shapes to the cells. The cells down near the basement membrane are almost always cuboidal shaped cells, but that's because they're young and multiplying and never have a chance to grow up. The cells that mature, that have a, a, the time to slowly be pushed up toward the surface, have that chance to mature. And so we always identify a stratified epithelial tissue by the cells that are at the surface of the many layers of cell. And in this case, those are squamous cells. This, of course, is the type of tissue that we find on the surface of your skin. And the other thing about those squamous cells is as they get farther and farther the surface, they dry out more and more as they approach the outside world. Uh, they begin to die, and they form that dead skin cell layer on the outside of our skin. But let's give this tissue a name then, like we did before. This is the stratified squamous epithelium. So you can see that. There's the pattern. In every epithelial tissue, we just use the word epithelium to, to indicate what it is. All right, so there's one type. A second type of stratified is stratified cuboidal. And since the base cells that are multiplying are the cuboidal cells, and all the cells are cuboidal, then this is a pretty simple type. Here, we typically don't have many, many layers. You saw maybe 50 or 100 layers in that stratified squamous epithelium. Here, you see just a couple of layers. If you look at the picture to the right, um, of this tissue under the microscope. You see just basically two, perhaps in some places, three layers of cells. So this is what we would refer to as stratified cuboidal epithelium then. And lastly then, the stratified columnar, following the pattern that we've seen. Here are cuboidal cells at the bottom, the ones that multiply and columnar cells near the surface. In the picture to the right, you can see that there's a lot more cytoplasm to the cells at the surface than there are 
at the cells at the basement membrane. So this is typically a tissue that has just a few layers of cells. Um, if you see many, many, many layers and the surface are squamous, you know it's simple squamous. The stratified columnar epithelium here and the stratified cuboidal are both tissue types that are fairly rare in the human body. Of course, stratified squamous is everywhere as it, as it makes up the skin. These are a little bit more rare, and we'll talk about where we might find some of these tissues in just a little bit. But let's deal finally with, in the stratified epithelial tissues, the special type here. And remember, in this characteristic, the shapes of the cells, this is where we find the difference in our special uh, stratified tissue. Remember, um, two of the cell shapes are squamous and cuboidal. This special tissue is called transitional. And you would want to think, okay, what what does it mean to transition? If something transitions, the word is usually used to say that it's changing from one thing to another. And that is the case here. Let's look at two different views of the exact same tissue. So here is two pictures of the same exact tissue in two different circumstances. Transitional epithelium is typically found in the urinary bladder. And one of the things we know about our urinary bladders is that they blow up, they inflate with urine. You know when your bladder is full. You know when you need to go. And the urinary bladder is not like a fixed storage tank, um, like a, just an object, like a gas tank that you just, it could be full or it could be partly empty and have air inside. The urinary bladder is like a balloon. And as, as the body pushes urine into it to store it, it inflates like a balloon would. As it, as it inflates, the epithelial tissue that lines the inside of the bladder changes by stretching. So in an empty bladder, you can imagine that uh, the tissue is thick, like you see there. It's many, many cell layers. It is a stratified tissue type, and that's important because if this is lining the bladder, it's lining it because we want to keep the urine in the bladder. We don't want the urine to leak back into the human body. And so your urinary bladder is built with a stratified epithelium that's going to prevent that. But as you can imagine, you've got a certain amount of epithelial tissue in there. And if the bladder is going to inflate, as it does, that tissue, that transitional epithelium, is going to have to stretch to become wider and thinner, as you see in the other picture. So putting it under a microscope, um, if you put um, the transitional epithelium from an empty bladder there, it's going to look like a stratified cumoidal sort of tissue. But if you had cut a piece of tissue from a bladder that was very full and it's sort of frozen in that stretched out shape, it would look very much like a stratified squamous sort of epithelium, other than not the real stratified, because that would have cuboidal cells at the bottom, but this, these cells can stretch out and still maintain that layering that's going to keep the urine in the bladder. Here's a picture of what bladders would look like if they're full or empty. So if you look at the empty bladder on the left there, you can see that the tissue is quite thick, and you can see that it stretches out in the case of the full bladder. So transitional epithelium is known because the cells change shape as the tissue stretches. Most epithelial tissues are not capable of stretching. They are what they are, but this one is unique. So here are our four simple types and our four stratified types. You should be able to recognize these visually and be able to name these various tissue types. 
The last thing that I want to do with you is just make sure that you could name some places where these tissues might be located. And so here's um, locations for simple epithelial tissues. Think of the shape of the tissue as we describe each of these. Simple squamous, for instance, you know, is very, very thin. And so what role does that play? What the role does a very thin epithelial tissue play? Well, it's just going to be a lining. The heart has chambers inside, hollow spaces that fill with blood, and the inner surfaces of the chambers of the heart are going to be lined with a very simple squamous epithelium, as are the blood vessels of the body. All the tubes that pass through your body are going to be lined with a simple squamous epithelium. Your body cavities, thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, pelvic cavity, simple cavities, uh, isolated areas. You're not going to get the outside world into the body cavities themselves. So a very, very simple, thin lining is all that it takes. The simple cuboidal cells are found in places where you're going to be moving food or waste products uh, across from the inside of the body to the outside. And one of the common places we find simple cuboidal epithelium is in the urinary system and in the kidneys, many of the tubes of the kidneys that are facilitating moving waste products out of you are going to be have tubes that are lined with simple cuboidal epithelium, like those pictures we saw when we were explaining this tissue. Simple columnar epithelia are either used to sort of as a barrier or in places where we're going to absorb resources like food materials in your digestive tract into your bloodstream. <clears throat> so the digestive tract would be a good example of that. And pseudostratified columnar epithelia are really the, the most defensive of all these simple types. Here we can build a simple tissue that has many, many defenses. Um, you can see as to location the respiratory system is where we typically find this. And of course, this is the site of most common infections. Colds, often the flu, are respiratory infections. They're the most common of all infections. And that's because microorganisms easily pass in through our nose or mouth, either in the air we breathe or maybe through contact with our fingers to our mouth or our fingers to food and food to our mouth and they get into those tissues um, that lead down into the respiratory system. So what are the defenses here? Well, I have the tall columnar cells in this pseudostratified type. They're tall columnar cells. They're the densest, most tightly packed cells. They, they produce a barrier of mucus over the surface of themselves that will typically catch and attract and stick uh, microorganisms into that mucus, and then they have cilia that actually move that mucus out of the respiratory system. So, pseudostratified columnar is very, very important in um, the defense of the respiratory system, which is so open to our outside world. In the stratified epithelial types, um, we have each of these, and notice that all of the three there are common to the integumentary system. The stratified squamous is, of course, 99% of it. This is the outer covering of all of the skin on your body. The stratified cuboidal are found in the composition of sweat and oil glands. We all know about sweating, and some of us have oily skin in places. There are actual glands in the integumentary system, in the skin, that produce those and send them out to the surface of your skin, both for lubrication and to cool your body. The simple columnar are also in the integumentary system, but down in special glands that we call mammary glands. These are most common in the production of milk. Those mammary glands produce a milk substance that is important in nourishing infants. So 
All three stratified types are associated with the skin of the body. And we mentioned earlier that the transitional epithelium is important in the structure of the urinary system. So there is the locations, the places that you would find these eight different tissue types that we're describing. So lastly, let's just, we mentioned a little bit about glands here. And really all of the glands that we find associated with the surfaces of the body are made from epithelial tissues. So we should know that. We could go into a lot of detail about all these shapes, and I've put them up there. You don't need to know those. You don't need to, th to know the three types of surface glands, or what we often called exocrine glands. But you should know that the epithelial tissues fold themselves down into little pockets beneath the surface of the skin to structure things like sweat glands, oil glands, mammary glands, those kinds of things. So be sure you can identify structures like glands as being formed from epithelial tissues. Pretty simple. Don't, don't go into a lot of detail here. Okay? And so that's really it. Here are the epithelial tissues diagrammed by their layering type and by their, the shape of their cell types and a couple of special types. And uh, so make sure you clearly understand and can identify and know where to find these tissue types that we've just talked about, these epithelial tissues. And that's it. The next lecture will uh, cover and discuss the connective tissues of the human body. So there we go.